Welcome back to Module 6. In this video and the next one, which will be our final video of this semester, we'll be going through Chapter 30 of OpenStax Astronomy. We've made it to the end of the book and the end of our curriculum. So in this video, we're going to be focusing on a discussion of astrobiology, or the study of life outside of Earth's environments. And in the next video, we'll be thinking about intelligent life out there. So we want to start by understanding what it means to have life. Now this is not a biology class. We're not going to spend a lot of um, time going through the, the details of all of the different aspects that determine life versus not life. Uh, instead, for our curriculum, we're going to focus on three kind of key things that all uh, life forms on Earth have in common. All life forms on Earth are built with carbon-based chemistry. What that means is the different chemical reactions that are kind of required for the processes that are involved in keeping living things living uh, have carbon in different complex molecules. And I highlight that because when we think about what the universe is made out of, we identified in our previous video that the universe began with almost entirely just hydrogen and some helium. So the fact that we have carbon in our biology is stars in their cores making helium into carbon after they left the main sequence in the triple alpha process and building the building blocks that we need for life billions of years later. It's really kind of immense when you think about it. The other thing that all living uh, beings on Earth have in common are uh, the use of deoxyribonucleic acid or ribonucleic acid, so DNA and RNA, to store information in cells. And I bring that up because the building blocks for those molecules are amino acids, and that's something that we'll um, briefly touch on in our discussion. And then uh, liquid water. The existence of liquid water is essential for living things on Earth. Life started in and near the oceans on Earth, and human beings are more than 50% water, and so we need that water to exist. And when we see a um, picture of the Earth's surface, or when we think about the globe of the Earth, we typically think of these huge oceans that we have, but I need us to recognize just how uh, shallow those oceans all are. Life on Earth is a really delicate and tenuous balance. And in the past couple of years and moving forward, that balance continues to, um, to shake uh, and, and change. And it is so essential that as a human, um, as humanity, uh, we come to terms with the relationship we need to have with the Earth in order to be able to continue living here. So some of the factors that make our planet livable are that we have a solid surface. So uh, animals can walk around on that rocky solid surface. Uh, plants can root down into that rocky solid surface. We have moderate temperatures. So temperatures that allow it to be not too hot and not too cold in that just right habitable zone that we first learned about when we talked about exoplanets. That temperature is rising due to global warming, and it's not just that everything is getting hotter, because it is, but that higher temperature is also creating bigger storm systems, things that we have to uh, kind of recognize we, we need to adapt and change and prepare for. And then liquid water is available, one of the key parts of living things here on Earth, but when we look at the image on the slide, we see just how little water there truly is. The largest of these little blue spheres is all of the water in all categories, mostly oceans. The next smallest sphere is the fresh water, a lot of which is in uh, the ice caps. And then the smallest dot, which you can barely see on the map itself, but at the bottom is uh, indicated is our lakes and rivers, the easily accessible fresh water, which is such a tiny amount when you consider the entire globe uh, and its scale. So we have to take care of our planet. Now, when we think about our planet and life on it, we want to think about when that happened. So let's consider a timeline of the entire universe. So from the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago to now, 
And we want to crunch it down into a day so we can try to process what these times really mean for us. I encourage you to check out the link in the posted slides to different amounts of time that you can do this same milestone uh, search for, including if the entire universe were down to a year. So, using a day as our model, our timeline, the Big Bang happened by definition at the stroke of midnight. Our day starts with the Big Bang. That's when time begins. Uh, it is when the whole universe is hot and dense and full of photons and light. It takes 16 hours for the sun to show up. So that is, that is two-thirds of our entire day. Uh, two-thirds of the history of the universe, our solar system isn't around. So the sun forms around 4 p.m. in this crunched down model, and the earth finishes forming around 4.38 p.m. in this model. When the earth forms, it's molten, it has to cool down, uh, it has a solid surface, it gains um, its oceans from comets over time, and it still takes another hour in our crunched down timeline for life of any kind to show up. And on the next slide, we'll be talking about what those earliest forms of life look like. But that happens around 5.55 p.m. We're now three quarters of the way through our timeline, and that's when life of any kind, single-celled organisms, shows up on Earth. And then humans, we tend to have an oversized view of our importance, although we certainly have an oversized effect on Earth's environments. We show up four seconds before the next stroke of midnight. We have not been around for a very long period of time when we think about the grand astronomical scales of time. And yet we have had such an effect. We have been able to make so much creative work, art and, and music and um, beautiful things, as well as a lot of the destructive things that, that we've learned about. Now, let's talk about those earliest forms of life, and then we can start to think about uh, more advanced life. The oldest existing fossils that have been discovered on Earth are called stromatolites, and they are colonies of single-celled organisms, microorganisms, bacteria, um, different algal mats, things like that. And fossils as old as 3.4 billion years old have been found. Now, a lot of the time in the discussion of evolution and the tree of life, sometimes we think of evolution as being steps, progress that have eventually led to humanity. And we need to make sure that we kind of take a step back and recognize that the tree of life means there's all of these different branching paths. This is one of the oldest branches, but that doesn't mean that branch got pruned. These organisms, these colonies of single-celled cyanobacteria, they still exist. They're still around, uh, living their life, uh, although it looks very different than the lives that we live. So stromatolites, there's a couple of different microorganisms that can create these. Uh, some of the ones that fit in this category that weren't necessarily the oldest are cyanobacteria, which use photosynthesis. So let's talk about that step briefly. Our solar system is over 4 billion years old. It's 4.5 billion years old uh, by radioactive dating. And photosynthetic bacteria are over 3 billion years old. So the process of turning the sunlight, the sun that we orbit, into usable energy for life forms uh, is a kind of discovery, an invention of biology that is three billion years old. And that was one of the most essential moments in the kind of history of life on Earth. Before photosynthetic bacteria showed up, our atmosphere looked very, very different. We now think of our atmosphere as being full of oxygen and oxygen being a good and positive thing. But before photosynthesis, there would not have been free oxygen in the atmosphere. And when these bacteria first formed and started putting oxygen out as a byproduct, that was actually toxic to a lot of other single-celled organisms that were in competition at the time. So it drastically changed our atmosphere to the atmosphere that we, that we think of today. And then the other big milestone that we'll mention, because again, this isn't a biology class, is uh, this huge explosion of different, more complex life that happened within the oceans about half a billion years ago. 
So the Cambrian explosion is when we have all of these different life forms, a whole bunch of different developments in the way that um, life shows up beyond just small, single-celled or um, less complex plant-type uh, organisms. And that's really where things uh, kind of ramp up from there. So again, we're not going to talk about all of the other uh, time points on this graph, but it is worth recognizing that uh, the Earth is teeming with life of different kinds, um, and it really is only about half a billion years that we can say that it's teeming with life. When we do want to think about life in our solar system, so astrobiology within our solar system, beyond Earth but nearby, uh, we have to recognize what kind of environments we might expect life to show up. None of the other planets have moderate temperatures and liquid water in big lakes and rivers the way that Earth does. So we can't look for um, environments that are kind of ready for humans to move into. Instead, we want to recognize that habitable env environments on Earth are already extremely diverse on Earth's surface. These images are all from our textbook in chapter 30, and we have an extremely acidic river that is so acidic it runs red. There are still extremophiles, so life forms that uh, thrive in these extreme environments living in that river. The middle picture is uh, hot springs from Yellowstone National Park. Uh, humans have uh, ignored warning signs and gone into those and perished. And again, not a place where we could survive, but there absolutely are life forms that are there. And then that third picture is uh, at the bottom of the oceans. There are entire ecosystems that don't use photosynthesis. There is no sunlight down there. Instead, it's this whole uh, chain of, of life forms that um, start with small plankton that take nutrients out of the billowing material that comes up from Earth's mantle. So all sorts of different environments where we can have uh, life exist already on Earth. So we want to broaden our horizon to what we might be thinking to look for in the solar system. Now, I love this graphic because it shows a kind of set of possibilities for where we might find life. Mars is definitely the place that um, captures the imagination most easily. Most sci-fi stories that involve life elsewhere in our solar system use Martians, right? It is the planet that is, uh, it feels most likely that we could terraform it. Venus is closest in size and, um, and uh, environment to the Earth, but it is incredibly hot and the atmosphere is so dense that it doesn't feel like we can terraform it as easily as Mars. Mars has always been the go-to, and as we um, start in our NASA program, the Artemis Project, to be thinking about these next steps, Mars is the target, the focus for those different um, crewed missions. Beyond that, we see an image of Europa. So Europa is one of the moons of um, Jupiter, and those kind of crisscrossing marks are indicating cracks in a icy surface. But if there's a solid icy surface, then if we keep going deeper, uh, the moon warms up and there might be subsurface oceans, so a big part of what we're looking for next. And it's only after searching in our own solar system that we'll talk about thinking about elsewhere. So Mars is certainly the most obvious candidate. We have found presence of um, past liquid water on its surface, including drilling that was done by the Curiosity um, rover over a decade ago. And there's lots of rovers that we have sent, that we will continue to send, and that we continue to learn more about the history of Mars's surface. Jupiter's moon Io, like I mentioned, but also Saturn's moon Enceladus, both show evidence of a subsurface ocean, and Europa is probably going to be the one, simply because it's closer, um, that is most likely to get an upcoming um, robotic mission to drill down underneath the surface and see what's there. Saturn's satellite Titan uh, had... So for the Cassini mission that was around Saturn for a long period of time, they also sent a probe through Titan's atmosphere, taking lots of images. It then crashed on the surface because you can't really slow it down. Um, and it was identified 
with the data that was taken that Titan does have a thick atmosphere. It's the only moon in the solar system that has a thick atmosphere. And it has lakes and rivers of methane on its surface. So methane is liquid at colder temperatures. And our chemistry that we know about for Earthlings would not work just replacing water with methane, but it is possible. Like, we can't rule out the possibility that there is a whole different tree of methane-based uh, life forms on, uh, on Titan. It wouldn't be intelligent walking around life forms, but bacteria were on Earth for billions of years before anything else exciting happened. So it's possible elsewhere in the solar system already has that kind of microorganism life on it. Now, when we think about life beyond our solar system, that is a tougher thing to do. We can't go and just gather samples. Like, we drill down into Mars's surface with the Curiosity rover. We will, at some point, send a mission that will, um, that will tunnel down uh, through Europa's icy surface. Outside our solar system is too far away for these kinds of missions to go to. So instead, we have to change our perspective. What is it that we would want to look for to see if there is life similar to what we expect um, that Earth has? So I mentioned before, photosynthesis uh, was this big step forward in astrobiology where um, bacteria took sunlight and... Um, took in carbon dioxide and put out uh, oxygen. Free oxygen, O2 molecules, are very volatile. They will interact chemically with something else and no longer be free oxygen. So the fact that our atmosphere is full of it is because there is constantly sources of free oxygen being added to our uh, atmosphere. So if an alien uh, civilization far away were to look at the spectrum of Earth's uh, atmosphere, when they saw oxygen lines, oxygen absorption lines, they would know that there is biology of some kind on our surface. So we look um, on exoplanets uh, for oxygen lines as well. And then one of the easier things to do, because our technology is only starting to get to the point where we can have that level of detail for exoplanet uh, atmospheric spectra, is just looking for exoplanets that are the right distance from the sun. So places or th their star, right? Um, so if an alien civilization were to look at the sun from far away, our own sun, it would know that the surface was 6,000 Kelvin uh, and that Venus is a little too close to have liquid water. It'd be too hot. And Mars is a little bit too far away to have liquid water. It's too cold. But Earth is right in the middle of the perfect distance away from the sun. So we would look for that for other stars as well. Based on the type of star, based on the temperature of that star, we want to find uh, planets that are at the right distance where liquid water would exist as a liquid and not as a gas or solid. So JWST was launched in 2021, and it's going to be what the big mission to pay attention to if you're interested in this um, idea of searching for life elsewhere. Uh, JWST has the capability to study exoplanet uh, atmospheric spectrum in enough detail that if oxygen absorption lines were present, JWST would be able to see it. So we've already detected water uh, in different spectra. There's been lots of different discoveries that are interesting to astronomers, but are not that telltale sign of biological activity the way that free oxygen would be. So keep an eye on the news and that, um, and I look forward to the time when I have to update this slide and update this video um, because of an exciting, uh, an exciting progress update. When, uh, when we do eventually find oxygen absorption lines somewhere else, that's going to be the, um, the proof or evidence, rather, of some kind of like bacterial life. It is going to be a whole different story to try to look for signs of intelligent life, and that's where we're going to finish with our last video of the whole semester. So I look forward to talking through that with you in the next video. Thank you for watching.